Amen and amen. That's all I want to do. It's good to see you today. Praise the Lord. We're going to last of a message on our series of messages on sync, getting our lives in sync with the Lord and getting a, a relationship that is properly in line with God's will and God's purpose for our life. We've talked about this going on now seven weeks as we've de dealt with this series about synchronization of our hearts and our minds, uh, getting our lives where we are walking according to God's will and purposes for our life and all the different areas of our life we've been talking about that we get in course, that we're operating, we're moving, we're, we're in His will. That's the bottom line of it all. That whatever part of our life, whatever area of our life that we're looking at, that it is in tune, in sync, and in place with God our Father. We're doing His will. We've talked about a lot of these different things over the last several weeks, but five, uh, six and seven, the two parts we were dealing with last week and this week, all deal about getting that application of our love life in order and in sync. If there's anything we ought to learn from the Lord, it's certainly about love, because God is love. Uh, there's so many passages on, in, in, that talk about the love of God, and for there as many as that talk about how God is love, there's as many more that talk about us being the same way, that we ought to be lovers. We ought to be people who love life, who love God, who love people, and obviously in our relationships, it's certainly in the right order. We, we t shared a scripture from John 13 last week, which says, having loved his own, he loved them unto the end. Now we know that's the end of his earthly ministry, not to the end of his, his life because he's eternal life and he died and rose from the dead for us. But we know that God's love is vast. It's all encompassing. It covers every area and every part of my life. We would have no hope whatsoever if God were not love. Amen? God did not choose to love us. If he did not set us aside and say, I'm going to love you, then there really wouldn't be much hope. We started talking last week about how misunderstood this particular word is in our culture. We just don't really get what it means to love someone anymore. And uh, we, we, we're just, we're a, we're, we just won't make commitments anymore. People don't know about long-term, lifetime, long-life commitments. And we've really lost the understanding of what it really means to have a, a love that's genuine and a love like Jesus had that loves us to the end. We gave a definition for true love last week. It's an unselfish choice for someone else's highest good. We also talked about the words that were used in the Bible for love in the English, how that in the New Testament translated from the Greek language, we talked about all the different words there were for this one word, love. In the English language, we love Dr. Pepper, we love Coca-Cola, we love our wife, we love our dog, we love, you know, we love football, we love, you know, whatever it might be. And it becomes very loose as to, to really what we mean when we say we love something. I, I, I would certainly hope you love uh, your wife more than you love Dr. Pepper. You know, that we get down, we have a deeper understanding. Well, in the Bible, there's this, this, this word that's used of God's love, even though in the English language it just says love. It's this word agape that we use from the Greek language. It has to do with this, this kind of love we're talking about. An unselfish choice for someone else's highest good. That God loved us that way. God made an absolute unselfish choice by sending his son Jesus Christ to die for us. There was nothing lovely about us. We were rebellious, we were lost, we were dead in our trespasses and sin. There wasn't anything that was lovable. But God chose over and against his own self and sending his son to die for our sin. The Bible tells us he committed his love toward us. And now that he's commended his love toward us and we've experienced his love, he says now he even gives us the ability to love this way. He shed the love of, uh, uh, the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. In other words, now that I'm a Christian, now that I know Jesus Christ personally is my Lord, he's my Savior, my Master, he has given to me a unique capacity to love the way that he loves. Now, I know there's a lot of times that people would make unselfish choices, but to do it in a way that God has done it is certainly a, uh, only can come by His hand and His mercy where He chooses to place that kind of love in, in each one of our hearts and lives. So here's this unselfish choice for someone else's high, highest good. It involves your will, not just your emotions. And many times that's the... The, the main aspect when we talk about love, especially in relationships and loving my wife or loving this girl or you, some guy loving uh, her or some, some girl loving this guy. We use the, the term quite loosely and I don't think that most people, even in that uh, early years, really understand we say we love somebody because, well, they make us feel good. We say we love somebody because, man, they just, you know, I, you know, I get goosebumps when I'm around them. I, I, I love them, well, you know, they, 
and look how good they look and you know they're, they're, they're pleasing to the eye that's not the kind of love the Bible's talking about now that may get started in your life in a relationship that someone is attracted to you you're attracted to them there's this mutual emotional thing that's going on but if you're really going to love somebody it has to go beyond that you know I, I think it was Ruth Graham that wife of Billy Graham that says you know if, if she'd married every man that she felt emotional about she'd been married nine times you know? So it goes beyond that. She was only married once to the man she chose to love, Billy Graham. So it's the same thing in her life. And I see this happen in our culture, especially because there's such emphasis upon the look and the feeling and all this external stuff. And that's why people hop in and out of relationships and there's no deep commitments made to anyone, no long-term life endearing kind of commitments because people really don't have any comprehension about what this kind of love really is. And it's a deeper, higher, more noble kind of love. It, it's not based on conditions. It's this in spite of love. Now, that's why I think it's important that if you're a Christian and you're a single person, your focus for a relationship mate for the future, for life and marriage, should be somebody who knows the Lord Jesus Christ. There's plenty of verses that talk about that, obviously, not being yoked together with unbelievers. Why is that? Because the love of your life, ultimately, if you really are a Christian, is Christ. And God has for you a, a life partner that you should be able to share Christ and the love you enjoy with Christ with each other. That, you know, it's not a hindrance to your walk. It's not a hindrance to your life. It's not a hindrance to your testimony. It's somebody that's going to be there to, to, to encourage you to be more like Christ. Somebody that you're going to encourage to be more like Christ. It's not going to be a, a battle. It's going to be a relationship and it's going to be fellowship. And it's going to be something that the most precious thing in your life is Jesus. That you can share that with somebody else throughout the rest of your life. People who don't comprehend that. People who think that that's not really a big deal if they're saved or not saved, believer or not believer, are headed for some bumpy roads. It may not be a big deal right now, but it's going to be a big deal later on. It's going to be a big deal when you start raising children. It's going to be a big deal when you start making life choices, and it's going to be important. So you realize that you've been given the capacity to love people like this. You, certainly, I think you should marry somebody that knows how to can love you that same way, this un unconditional, in spite of that agape kind of love. You show me somebody who wants to live in a fornicating relationship, sex outside marriage, all those things, uh, that has a moral perversion about their life, they're not somebody who's in love with Jesus Christ first and foremost. And so you need to get first things first and right things right. You know, by the way, the devil is a pervert. He always reverses stuff, you know, where we talk about it having a relationship and this dating or engagement process where you get to know somebody and then marriage follows and then there's intimacy and relationship goes on and deepens. Satan wants to put all that backwards and start with, well, let's start with the physical because you really got to see if you're compatible. Well, that's, that's, that's garbage, all right? Because let me tell you, it doesn't matter in that level as much as it matters in the spiritual level because the spiritual thing is an eternal thing. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't diminish, it gets better and brighter. Whereas the physical aspects, hey, well, I hate to tell you this, but you're getting older. Changes come. As I said last week, you won't be referred to as that hunk of a man. You'll be the chunk of a man. Right. It just happens, all right? And if you build your relationship on that, what happens when the bodies begin to change and the hair begins to fall out and the teeth, you know, all the other stuff that goes as well, you know? You know, there's, there's no love. There's no commitment. There's none of this kind of in spite of love. So we understand that there's this importance for genuine love, even though it's such a misused term, that true love is an important part of your, of your life. So let me give you quickly, I'll, I'll run over a couple of these we talked about last week. It starts, obviously, true love. It responds to the total person where it says that Jesus increased, and it kind of gives you an insight of how we are, of wisdom and stature and favor with God and favor with man. It talks about here the, the social aspects of life, the, 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 the mental aspects of life, and obviously the spiritual aspects of life. There's there's more to us than, than meets the eye. And there's more to the person you're interested in than just meets the eye. I mean, they may be quite attractive, but they may be socially, you know, a dunce, you know. They don't know how to relate to people. They're narcissistic. They're all self-centered. They're all wrapped up in themselves. So, you know, there's more than meets the eye. And when you say, I'm going to love somebody, it means you're going to love all of them, all right? And you're going to choose to love all of them. And so there's, if you're single, especially in this regard, you 
you need to, to make some wise choices here because this genuine love is going to respond and be responsive to every act, every part of the other person's life. And it's, 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 the, it's the basis of that, uh, the foundation that's going to be the basis of making it work successfully is going to be that spiritual aspect if they know Christ, if they're committed to Christ, because then you have a foundation which to build in your life on that total aspect of the person. So don't just look externally. Look at the elements of their life. See how they are in their relationship with God, how they relate to other people. And you'll be surprised if this is the, to make the choice, this is the person you're going to invest in on that level. Then the second part of this, we talked about true love being accept the responsibilities as well as the privileges. In other words, there's this point in your life, if there's going to be genuine real love, it's going to cost something. We talked about how Peter wrote the Thessalonians last week and talked about the labor of your love. So if you really do love someone, you're committed to work it out. You're committed to deal with the problems. You take the positives, you take the negatives in this regard, and you're going to deal with it. And, uh, and most people, you know, they, they don't want to have to deal with the problems. They want some kind of uh, intimacy in the relationship, but they don't want to have genuine intimacy on the other levels. They only want a physical relationship. And that, that's not what relationships, that's not what lasting relationships are. That's not what marriage is going to be made of. There's, there has to be this, this commitment to another person. It says, you know, I'm, I'm with you for the long haul, and it's, and it's not about sex, and it's not about how you look. It's about you as an individual. I'm choosing to, 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 to love you and to sacrifice for you, and I'm willing to be obedient to God and, uh, and, and, and to commit to you for the rest of my life. In marriage, basically, that's what you've done. You've made a holy vow. You, you made a covenant. In fact, you made a promise before God that you would commit yourself to this person till death do you part, and it will take paying a price at different times. There will be sacrifices that will be involved. But the key to making it all happen is the one who is love. The key to your, a good relationship, a deepening relationship, an intimate relationship on every level is this obedience to God. Because your obedience to God, their obedience to God brings you into a deeper relationship not only with God, but with each other. When I used to speak on this at a lot of conferences for youth, and I did a book years ago called Love, Lust, Romance, How to Know It's Real. In fact, I did a True Love Weight seminar this Friday night in an associational meeting. I, I would get on, and, and, and that back when you had chalkboards and stuff, I, I would draw a, a, a dot at the top of the deal, and I'd say, put God over that, and I'd draw a dot over here, and I'd put you over that, your name, and over on this dot, I'd put, you know, the person whom you were uh, infatuated with or thought you may love for the rest of your life. And so showed how that in this relationship, if you'll both start moving, draw the line up to God, and that's the goal of your relationship, first and foremost, is to honor God with your lives. You find somebody who wants to honor God with their life, that as you go up towards God, what is happening? You're draw, being drawn closer and closer and closer and closer and closer together. You have a common, high objective and goal. That is to glorify God in your body and in your spirit. And what happens? That's where real intimacy begins to come in, and that's when you begin to trust. That's when you begin to care. That's when you begin to commit to one another, all right? So there's this idea that I'm willing to sacrifice what my own desires might be so that we can have the relationship that God wants us to have. We can be what God wants us to be. The third point we pointed out was that true love will display itself in mutual respect, all right? It's not just about a good feeling or feeling this sense of pleasure around someone just because they're nearby. There is something that's got to be deeper than that. Because that sense of pleasure, something you just feel about being around somebody, that's really just selfishness on your part. Well, I like how they make me feel. Real love's got to go beyond that. I'm concerned about them. I'm concerned about the other person. I've tried to share with my children as well as every young person I've ever taught in conferences or seminars and in ministry is, you know, when it gets down to this particular issue of, of other people and these relationships, you have to realize that that other person, you know, is a child of God. Even if they're lost, they still belong to God, even though they haven't submitted their life to Jesus. And you treat those other people with a, with a, with a respect, especially somebody who does know Jesus Christ because ultimately their body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, just as your body is. And there ought to be about your relationship some element of that, that which is sacred. I believe people have lost that concept in their marriage, that your marriage relationship is holy, it's sacred, something God designed, and you should treat it with the, uh, what we would say kids' gloves. You ought to treat it with spiritual gloves and realize that I have an ultimate responsibility before God about my marriage. My wife, God's put her in my care, and I'm ultimately responsible to God. So I realize there's this element of that which is sacred about my relationship. 
And that ought to be transposed, especially if you kids are thinking about, you know, you're, you're, you're looking at dating and relationships, and, or maybe you're a single young person. There has to be an understanding of, of the sacred in, in all of this, an understanding of the, the holiness of God and that God has created us in His image and that you have this responsibility to recognize that this person is in and to give, because of that, a, a, a respect, a deep respect for the other person. In fact, one of the greatest ways in your marriage relationship you show that you do love each other is when you give each other that kind of respect one to another. The last element we talked about last week was about this issue of, of devotion. You know, there's this, this issue of, 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 uh, of sacrifice, not exploitation. Now, I know all these are kind of uh, intermingled to some degree, but they are unique each in of self. I really believe when we discover what real love is, we, we begin to get to the point where we're not seeking to get something out of it, we're seeking to put something into it. So it's no longer this idea, what, what's in it for me? What can, I, what can I get out of this deal? It's what can I do to make this rich, to make it full, to make, make it meaningful? And we know what Jesus said anyway about this issue of giving. You now he was talking about obviously in, uh, in a material sense, but he said it's more blessed to, 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 to give, all right, than to receive. And some people in their marriages have begun to discover that's what's making it work. You're both giving. And as you do that, you're, you're blessed. Not only because you, you get back, the Bible says, but you get back more than you put into it. Problem is, are you making any investments in your marriage? Are you always sitting back saying, well, if they do this, I'll do that. If they don't do this, I don't do that. There's no sacrifice. It's just, well, what are you going to give me? And if you give me a little something, then, you know, I'll give you a little something. How about we change our perspective? How about we change our focus and start saying, hey, I want to give into this thing, and I'm willing to, not just, we said, play, but to pay. I'm willing to sacrifice. I'm willing to make commitments. There's that passage on the screen that talks about husbands, dwell with your wives according to knowledge, you know, and giving honor unto the wife as the weaker vessel. Now, in, in the Joe Arms translation, it says this, husbands, find out what your wives like and do that. And find out what they don't like and don't do that. Most of us are just the opposite. You know what ticks her off. You know what sets her off. And I'm bad about this. I'll, I'll, I'll be honest. And praise the Lord, Kathy's taking care of a, of a thing right now for me in the office. But uh, uh, I told her she hadn't always had to come and sit and listen to me twice. I, that would drive me crazy. Enough. And, <laughs> but the idea is that, you know, it's just, I, I know what sets her off, you know. And I'm, that, I, I'm just teasing, you know. I'm, I'm that kind of person. I like to tease. I think it's pretty much just I want attention. Don't laugh at me, you're just the same way. So when I don't think I'm getting enough tension, you know, I start poking and prodding and saying stuff, you know, and it just drives her mad. You know, she just, but she stay, hey, praise the Lord, she's hung in there, amen? So keep praying for her, all right? And pray for me. But the idea is that, that some people do that not just to get attention, they just do it to be mean or to get even. That's not what we're talking about here, you know? And this is what he's saying here. You, if you know something doesn't work, don't do it. Uh, you, d you dwell with your car according to knowledge, all right? You watch the gauges, you pay attention. At least you should. Gas gauge, you go in, you can put the gas. All gauges are on, but I better get on. You, know, you check those things. If it's heating up, hey, it's time to put something in there, all right? Be sensible in your relationship. You ought to be able, after some time especially, to be able to read other people and know exactly what's going on. And I think this is where the Bible talks about in regard to our marriage and honoring someone, is we ought to be, we ought to be able to list the things that we're doing to edify them, not to destroy them. We ought to be do, listing the things that encourage them and not, not hinder them in their walk. That's part of genuine, true love. It's devotion and that kind of commitment. Then there's this, the idea that true love, it has this protective nature, all right? That you desire to protect the ones that you love. You, you want to naturally, and I think this comes naturally to men as well, for the most part. We want to shield those people that we care about. We don't want, we don't want them to be harmed. You know, I've seen small men stand up against men twice their size in a defensive posture for their wives, all right? And I've seen some guys that are so, you know, have you ever seen the guy, he's about 5'4", and his wife's 6'8", you know? You know, she looks like she plays for the Texans. And then to see him try to defend her, I mean, she could probably take care of herself. She's just that athletic person, you know. But he jumps out to defend. Well, there's something of love there. He, you love, you want to defend, you want to shield. And I say, it's just that part of a man's makeup to want to protect loved ones from outside dangers. But the problem is this. It's not always the outward sources. The, the most destructive things in a relationship are really the internal enemies, the anger, the criticism, the cynicism, the sarcasm. Proverbs 18 says that the words of a talebearer are like wounds and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. 
I mean, do you find yourself saying I love you on one hand and then saying other things that are destructive, mean-spirited, harmful? Like I say, you know where the buttons are many times. Sometimes we, we try to be cute or, 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 or tried about something. You know, you, know, like you, you come in and you ask your wife, you know, something like, you know, uh, what's, tonight's, what's the burnt offering for tonight's dinner? <laughs> you, there's just things that, that don't work. Uh, it, it's not going to go very far for you at all. The Bible tells us in, in Proverbs 18, 21, that the death and life are in the power of the tongue and they shall eat the fruit thereof. So in other words, what you say with your mouth is what you're probably going to get back. You know, if that's all you, if you're just dealing out death instead of life, you know, no wonder that the dinner's burnt. Maybe it wasn't an accident. <laughs> the tragedy is, is that we say we love people and who do we hurt the most? Usually it's those we love the most. Who is it that hurts us the most? It's usually those that, that love us the most. That's why it hurts so deeply because it's that person close to us. I mean, your greatest defenses in life, they hadn't come from the person on the job probably. They've come from someone that was close to you, near to you, dear to you, an aunt, an uncle, a brother, a sister, a cousin or somebody that was so close and it hurt deep because they were, there was this closeness. That's why it cut so deeply and wounded so much because of the relationship was there. So we have to be cautious about what we say. And the dangers aren't, aren't always the, the dangers from without. There's many times the dangers from within. And there's a lot of people who are, are suffering deep wounds at the hands of people that, that supposedly say they love them. So what do we do? We learn to say things and do things and speak words that bring life and not, not death. The quality of love should be manifest to those closest to you, your, your parents, your children, your friends. That's, that's what we're talking about. Those relationships certainly ought to be the most, most guarded, the most protected, and the ones you watch over. I love this passage in 1 John where Jesus is speaking through the apostles. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knows God. He that loveth not doesn't know God, because God is love. If we say we know God, he's saying, then you manifest it by the love you have for God and for one another. But if you say you love God and you don't manifest that love for, for those, especially those who are the closest to you, husbands, wives, children, those people, then certainly maybe we're missing the mark here. Maybe we're missing something that God's trying to say to us. And although we may not agree with them, or maybe it's a child who's out of the will of God or obvious rebellion, sometimes the love is manifest in different ways, but we still never stop loving. We continue to love. Number six, true love is characterized by mutual enjoyment of somebody else's company without the need for a constant physical expression. This is the stuff marriages are made of. You know, a lot of people think that marriage is all about intimacy in a physical place in the bedroom. And that's kind of, you know, they think that, you know, uh, uh, marriage is some kind of like legalized prostitution or something. You certainly miss the mark. Intimacy, physical relationships are obviously part and a very big part of a marriage relationship but understand that marriage is not an extended date, all right? Nor is it legalized prostitution. Physical expression in your marriage relationship is very, very, very important. The scripture tells it not to withhold that from each other as a man and wife because it opens the door for temptations. But if all your relationship is about is just the physical, and that's what you think it's all about, then you're really headed for some big trouble and your relationship is not gonna last. It's just not gonna last. And I, I, know, I know some marriages that have missed the mark because they thought that was all about, the bedroom. I know some young people who thought that that's what marriage was all about or and it really wasn't important to get married because really if, if we love each other, it's all about physical intimacy and we just do whatever we want to be and, and we can do anything. Or then there's other couples, you know, the young couples, they get together and, you know, and, and they just can't be together without hugging and squeezing and clinging and holding. And everywhere they go, they look like they've been glued together. All right. I'm always having to cut fuss at kids in youth groups or as pastors. You say, hey, get some space here. All right. The relationship has to be about more than the physical things. If that's all your relationship depicts, then something's wrong with your relationship. All right. It's not going to work out that way because then it becomes just built on what I get in my flesh and how I feel in my flesh, and that can boil down ultimately to lust and what I'm just getting out of it for myself. I mean, romance is nice, but it's not the glue that makes everything hold together. Even in marriages conferences, there's a lot of emphasis put on romance. Romance is good. We need romance. But that's not everything that holds it together. It's, it's committing our hearts and lives first as individuals to Christ 
and seeking to love one another as he loves us, that's what makes it all work. That's what makes it last. The act of marriage, this physical expression of marriage, is, is, a, is a physical unity which God has intended only for the place of marriage. In marriage, the scripture says, is the bed undefiled. If you're outside of marriage and you're having that kind of physical intimacy in your life, you're out of the will of God. And you're getting things reversed. And I said earlier, the devil's a pervert. He's going to try to pervert your life. And you'll find out many times people who are promiscuous before marriage, sometimes you see them also, that promiscuity after marriage. But I'll tell you one thing that's true. Usually for those who've been pure before marriage, 90% of the time there's purity in marriage. Occasionally you have those that just don't hold to the vows they made. But true love is a willingness to commit myself to you to the point I say I don't have to have physical elements to it all the time. Is real genuine love. True love, number seven, carries with it a sense of ownership. Strings attached. And you've heard people say, well, you think you own me. If you're married, the answer is yes. You don't like that. Some of you don't like that. <laughs> but it's true. When you got married, God did something in your hearts, in your lives, though you did not see it and maybe you didn't understand it all. But when you got together before God and made a sacred oath and covenant, God made you one. One. All right? Therefore, you are now, here was Adam's word, you are now bone of my bone, you are flesh of my flesh, we two are one. There's the beauty of it. That, that's the whole context of what Adam was saying to Eve. Now, Ephesians says pretty much the same thing. Husbands ought to love your wives. Why? Because they're you. You know? You, you, you belong to each other. You, if you love your wife, you're loving yourself. Why? Because you're one. So the best thing you can do for yourself, sir, is love your wife. That's pretty what I say. If you nourish and cherish her, then that's nourishing yourself, and it's cherishing yourself. Why? Because you are one person. You are owned, lock, stock, and barrel, first and foremost, by Jesus. And second of all, once you enter into a marriage relationship, you are owned, lock, stock, and barrel. The Bible says to the wife, your body's not your own. It says to the husband, your body's not your own. You belong to each other. And you're one. And you need to begin to live in the unity of that oneness that God has given us. We have this picture in the church. It says the church belongs to Jesus. In the same way, a wife and a husband belong to each other. We are one with Christ as a church. What I do affects my walk, my life, my testimony. The church's walk, the church's testimony out in the world. So it's important that I live a righteous life for the glory of God so that he's honored. In your marriage relationship, you said yes to this person, and that means nobody else. When I stood at an altar 36 years ago with my bride, Kathy, saw her come down the aisle, we took hands, we made commitments and vows to love each other for the rest of our lives and each other only. So when I said yes to Kathy, I said no to all the other girls, all the other women in the world. Yeah. Not that they were lining up. <laughs> but in the future, should one get in line? No! She did the same thing. There were probably a few lining up behind her, all right? We we're hoping it wouldn't work out. But nonetheless, it's still working. No, 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 no. Okay? <laughs> She said no to everybody else. When you get married in a relationship, when you're willing to make that commitment, it's no to everything, all those other elements, all those other relationships, no! And anytime you remove yourself from that, you forgot what true love is, and you are not a lover. You're too busy being selfish. Too busy being concerned about what you can get out of the deal. And it's going to present a problem in the years ahead of you. It's going to create all kinds of crisis in your home. Be a person of integrity. Be a person of your word. Be a person of honor and say it and then mean it. There are strings attached. You are owned. So if you don't be owned by that person, don't marry them. If they can't treat it right, deal with you right, act with you right, don't marry them. You've got a choice here. Now, I tell, tell you how many times I've heard husbands and wives come to my office. That's why I let Pastor Strickland do most of the counseling now. Come and say, well, you know, she's this and she's that. And I, you know, like that. I, I, I usually get right in the middle of the session by saying something like this. You married her. You married her. And when the wife comes in complaining about the husband and all the things, I say, excuse me. You married him. You said, there was something somewhere along. You made a commitment. So you're in it. Now, the beauty of this thing is that God can make it great. And God can make it glorious. 
But if you're going to be selfish, it's not going to be worth it. Because you can really boil down every marriage crisis in this room, if there's any, okay, to one thing. We have selfish hearts. Isn't that what Jesus said? Jesus said, Moses gave you the writ of divorce because, divorce because you have dirty hearts. <laughs> dirty hearts. So every divorce can be tracked down to, there's a dirty heart somewhere. We don't like to believe that, though, do we? True love will, will realize there's this element of strings attached. Let's move quickly along. This is what Adam said. She's bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. We, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of the man. And for this reason, a man's going to leave his father and his mother and cleave unto his wife. And they shall be one flesh. Leave and cleave. And what are you? You are now one person. So there is this sense of ownership. Then to know me is to love me. I know that some of y'all have been trying to figure that out about me for a long time, but you'll figure it out one day. What's, what are we talking about here? True love will take the time and the energy in a relationship. If it's going to be real love, if you're committed to really love another person the way they need to be loved, the way God wants you to love them, then there will be this element of communication. The, I mean, there is a feeling of belongingness when you get married, obviously, but it has to go deeper than just feelings. One of the most important things that we can do is learn how to open up in a relationship and talk with each other and share where we're at and share what God's doing in our life, share what our needs are, be honest with one another. It's it's important to communicate about mental things, emotional things, as well as the major things in life. And make sure that those communications are always not centered around yourself. It's kind of like the guy who takes a girl out to date and says, tell me about yourself, and then goes on for 30 minutes to tell you about his self, or vice versa. There's no place for a mutual communication. It's like prayer. Prayer's not you just running to your prayer closet telling God everything. It's waiting, hearing from God. In a relationship, it's waiting, hearing what the other person said. It, it's a two-sided corn, so to say. It can be a blessing. It can be a world of discovery, unless you're a self-centered person. You don't care about what they did. You don't care about their day. You don't care about what went on. You're tired. You just want to do whatever you want to do. And this is where you have to shake yourself out of your flesh, move to the life of the Spirit, and say, hey, there's something God wants to do in my heart, my home, my life, and this communicating is an important thing. And true love is an act of volition, remember. It's a self-conscious choice for someone else's highest good. So I want to know what the other part of my person, because we are one, what my mate, what my wife is doing and thinking where she's at. To know me is to love me. And what happens is greater love. Now out of this, again, these kind of are all related to one another, is true love brings about, I think, a, a couples really knowing uh, having a knowledge of each other. We call it ESP. And, and I'm not talking about extrasensory perception on the context of that which is occulting stuff, but I mean, there is a sensitivity to another person that you develop because you spend time with them. I can just look at my wife and I know what she's thinking. She can look at me. I mean, you, you ever been somewhere in public and somebody maybe, maybe it's during a sermon and the pastor says something, y'all just look at each other? <laughs> you know what each other's thinking. You, you, you may be somewhere out and somebody says something or the kids do something or something happens. You, you, look, you know what each other's thinking. I mean, you don't have to go to a... Why? Because you have communicated, because you do know each other, because you've taken the time to love each other. And that's where that comes from, this extra sensitive kind of person that you become. And it's really pictured in our relationship between Jesus and the church. As we grow spiritually as individuals and as a church, guess what? We know what God is thinking. His Holy Spirit lives in our life. We are one with Him. He begins to share with us. We begin to have an impression of what His impression is. We begin to understand things the way He sees them. And the more time we spend with Him, and the more time we communicate with Him, then the more we embrace His character and His mindset. So we begin not only to see what God is doing, we know why they're doing it. Now, when I got married as a young man to a young woman, there was a lot of things she would do. I had no idea why she did them. I would scratch my head and say, huh? And vice versa. Or she, I would walk into the room and she would be crying for no good reason in my mind. Making sense to me. But you know what? After 36 years, if she's crying, I know what it's about. 99.9999 tenths of the time. I know now why she does what she did. Why she does what she does. Why? Because I've begun to know her. That takes 
time, it takes commitment, it takes sacrifice on both of our parts for that to happen. That's the kind of relationship God wants you to have. God wants you to have a relationship where you get to grow old together and watch each other's teeth fall out. And it's fun, and it's enjoyable, and it's rewarding, and it's rich, and too few people will ever get to understand what that means and what that's really all about, to have that kind of relationship. True, genuine, true love will hold on to this relationship so that you really do begin to know each other. It's a communication that you've been having that breeds this, this special sensitivity and understanding. And people who are truly in love, I begin, believe, begin through time to really have a fusion of thoughts because they are one person. Isn't that what you want in life? Isn't that the kind of relationship you desire? As a young person, you know, it's, it's, it's more than about how, how she looks or how he looks, all right? Because everything that's attracting you on a physical level, I guarantee you will change. Every element of the physical will change. It's just time and the physical world we live in. And so it's your love needs to see beyond the external to, the, to what we've talked about, to this true person. And this is how we ultimately say it like this, true love grows, true love matures. You don't fall out of this kind of love. And as it grows and as it matures, it can become dynamic and not fleeting and not stagnant. It's not something you fall in and out of like you fall in and out of bed. Fall down the stairs. Well, I just, I just fell out of love. No, you didn't. You did not. There's no bruises, no sprained ankles. You quit loving. You just said, that's it, I'm not going to love anymore. That's where it comes to. Genuine love is going to mature. You know, a lot of people out there say, well, I'm just trying to find the right person, find the right person. How about you start right here and you just say, I'm going to be the right person. And I believe that as you seek to be what God's called you to be in your life, just when Adam and Eve, God said, you know, it's not good for you to be alone. Great. Go name the animals. What? Go name the animals. Maybe he's thinking, well, maybe out there amongst the animals, I'll find somebody. Imagine how he felt when a giraffe came around the corner. <laughs> or a hippo. I hope that's not her, Lord. <laughs> Go name the animals. There's a biblical principle here. Go do what God's told you to do. Do what God's told you to do. He's able to take care of the rest of your life. He's done everything. The Bible says in Romans, he's done everything by sending his son. Don't you think he will also take care of all the other needs in your life? You want to be a genuine lover? I really believe in the truest and the highest and the most moral sense. It means that, hey, I'm going to be the kind of person God wants me to be. And God's going to do in my life what will bring him the most glory. He's going to be honored in my life. And as I seek to honor him, and as this person comes in my life, it's not dependent on all of these external things because I'm going to commit to love them. It may start out, you know, when I met Kathy, I was infatuated. I, when I met Kathy, I was lost, all right? Lost, messed up, long-haired hippie. It wasn't really a hippie, but that's what the people look at me and say, I was a hippie. She was saved. Blew me away, as a matter of fact. I mean, when the first time I saw her, I'd never seen the kind of crowd I ran with. We didn't see a lot of purity. <laughs> and when I saw her, that look that comes with a woman and a young lady who's chosen to be pure, you can't get out of a bottle of makeup. All right? You, you just doesn't, there's, there's no glitter, there's no mascara, there's no makeup that, that, can, that can produce that. All right? You may get all these nice, even glow makeups and all that, but... What, when there's virtue the Bible talks about, add to your faith virtue, the first op, op, responsibility of your Christian life is to be virtuous, which has to do with purity, but also goes into a power for living. That's what real virtue is. God gives you the grace and the power to really live the kind of life you need to live. There's just nothing that can replace it. I have a friend of mine who, was a, who got saved, and she was a Christian artist years later, called, and her and her husband both, but she, she shared a testimony. She says, you know, uh, there was this big crusade, and I worked for our local radio station. She was a beautiful girl. She said, I worked for this local radio station. She said, and I was supposed to go down and cover this big religious event taking place in Houston. This is back when the Jesus movement was really breaking forth. She said, I sat up in the balcony taking notes, everything going on. She said, I noticed three girls in the front row. Just blew me away. They were just beautiful. They were like glowing. And so she said, immediately when it was over, I went, I had to talk to them. I was just distracted by them the whole service and everything. And she said, I went down and said, ladies, 
what kind of makeup are y'all wearing? What is it? Of course, they all just kind of chuckled and laughed because they began to share Jesus with us. She ultimately gave her life to Christ. Got saved. There is something about a young woman who will choose to be virtuous, who will choose to be righteous, who will walk in life, will be in love with Jesus Christ first and foremost, that that will be your number one man, Jesus will be, that pours out of your life, that will be a testimony. And to this day, I still see that in my wife. I still see it on her, her face. I still see it in her character. She's more like Jesus than about anybody I know. I'm serious. You may not like her. I love her, all right? <laughs> but she is. Anybody can put up with me for 36 years. It's got to be like Jesus, amen? <laughs> There's an element of the miraculous there, don't you think? <laughs> but it was just, it was just, it was mind-blowing. But it still had to come down to this with her and with me as well. When I gave my life to Jesus, she finally paid attention to me. Of course, she'd just going through a bad relationship with some guy, and I was immediately there to console her. <laughs> I'm the rebound guy. <laughs> Praise God for rebounds. Amen. But, you know, it really got down to this. Even though we both loved Jesus, we stood at the altar. We had to say, I am going from this day forward to choose to love you. Yeah, I mostly wanted to physically attracted to her. But it really got down to that. It gets down to that. It's, it's that every day of our lives. And that's what real godly relationships are. I've chosen. I said I would love you till the day I die. I mean it. I'm, I'm not going to be a man that's not of integrity. And I'm not going to be a liar. I'm in it. I want to do that. And you say the same thing to another person. It may be in your marriage relationship there's some struggles because you may need to go back and remember what you said. Okay? And honor those vows. Because the feelings are fleeting. The physical aspects, they change all the time. But there's something that carries you through on a deeper level, and it's that love, that agape love that God places in your heart and gives you this great capacity to love each other the way you need to be loved and for you to love them the way they need to be loved. And you never, ever don't reap if you keep on sowing. If you sow, you shall also reap if you faint not. I believe there's a crisis in our culture. People just want to get stuff and they don't want to give. But genuine love is going to reach out to the person you've chosen to love. You'll seek to understand them. You'll seek to, to love them, to encourage them, to build them up and to edify them and not to seek to destroy. If you find yourself in a destructive mode in your relationships, then you need to back away. And some of you, perhaps unmarried, are on a course that's very destructive. And you need to back off and honor the person whom you say you care about. And you treat them. The Bible tells us very clearly how to treat one another. Like a sister, like a brother, like a mother, like a father in our relationships. True love comes from God first and foremost. And brings glory and it, being, it brings honor to God. And it brings glory and it brings honor to your life. I know we've made a lot of mistakes in our lives. Praise God, he's the God who forgives us and who cleanses us. I would encourage you today, if you're saying you're feeling guilty or maybe you're feeling confused in your life, your relationships, that you start at the cross with Jesus and say, Lord, I need to get my heart and my life right with you. Maybe you've never given your heart to him. That's the first step. I, Lord, I give you my heart because I, out of the abundance of our heart, you know, everything comes. Our relationship to others, to God, to the world around us, I need to get my heart right with God. And when you get your heart right with God, then you can move forward in all the other relationships and your expectations can be in him and he doesn't disappoint. Amen. Would you stand with your heads bowed? Father, I